Welcome back everyone, and if you're new here, my name is Rob McFarlane and I take your favourite film and TV, analyse it to tell you just how the filmmakers do it. So grab a cup of coffee, or a cup of tea, if you're so inclined, sit back, relax. We're going to be taking a look at how Fight Club breaks your sanity with sound. Without further ado, let's have at it. Like so many others, I had become a slave to the IKEA nesting instinct. So, we're at the beginning of the movie, and we see the narrator slash protagonist in his home for the first time. This is where we actually get to see the space, the environment, and you'll actually notice the type of music playing in the background. I had to have it. The Klipsk personal office unit. Yep, that's elevator music. Now, you'd think that would be kind of strange because dramatically, that really doesn't say that much. But listen a little bit longer. Environmentally friendly, unbleached paper. I'd flip through catalogs and wonder, what's it's not just standard elevator music. This is composed music with this really subtle distortion on the tips, on the edges, almost like we're just able to hear something that's odd but can't quite put our finger on it. Environmentally friendly, unbleached paper. I'd flip through catalogs and wonder what this really helps set up the first layer, the distinct feeling that something isn't quite right. This could be part and parcel of the satire that David Fincher is working through, and to be honest, all his films have some form of social satire in them. But I think this is a really subtle hint that he's already at the point, at the beginning of the movie, he's already at the point of a psychological break. While you're taking your next sip of coffee, you may as well just hit like, hit subscribe, you know. It also really does help me so much to continue to make these videos for you. Yeah, nothing's real. Everything's far away. So we meet the narrator in his work, and he's got the thousand yard stare. Let's listen in. Everything's a copy of a copy of a copy. You'll notice in the background a distinct electrical hum. In this environment of the office, we could have heard many different types of sounds. It could have been an AC unit. It could have been the sound of lots of telephones going off, even fans. But instead, the overriding background sound here is of an electrical buzz. And this actually puts us on edge. It's really quite uncomfortable to hear because whenever you hear an electrical discharge, a spark, a fizz, we know something is going wrong. And I honestly believe that this buzzing sound is more about the narrator's current state of mind than actually what's happening in the room with him. Although, he has chosen sound effects that are contextually correct for the space that they're in. You can cry. <laughs> this is the moment the narrator thinks he has solved his insomnia. As you can hear in the background. <laughs> and then something happened. I let go. And I believe this is quite satirical. The reason for that is we are so early in the film, there's no way the character could have been taken through the changes required to achieve his desire of freedom. So, when we hear this choir, this is really the character, the protagonist, the narrator, thinking that he has found the answer to his insomnia by using the sound of a choir in the background, David Fincher is pointing at it saying, there is no way that this is the answer. Marla, the big tourist. Her lie reflected my lie. And suddenly, I felt nothing. I couldn't cry. At the moment we get the ultimate form of Marla Singer, disturbing him from finding his solace, we actually hear the classical music has changed and instead we hear a strained operatic voice in the background, almost stretching in pain. I couldn't sleep. Additionally, we hear the very ominous chimes of a large clock in the background. And this really makes us feel like this is the moment that everything's about to switch over. Next group. 
And for the eagle-eyed of you, you'll have noticed that Tyler Durden started popping back up again. Yeah. Most movies, when an explosion goes off, the filmmaker really wants you to hear it to feel the impact of that explosion. David Fincher has chosen to film the explosion in incredible slow motion. What this does is this takes the expansion, the impact of the explosion away from the moment and instead turns it into this almost ethereal thing. And he matches that with a sound, a really strange metallic whining sound in the background. Yeah. Moments later, when the narrator then calls Tyler Durden, we hear the same strange metallic whining sound in the background, signaling some sort of connection between the explosion and Tyler Durden from the very beginning. When Tyler Durden calls back, the whining sound is back and it is stronger and stranger than ever before. Again, it is totally pointing at how strange and odd Tyler Durden is. Yet, we still don't guess that he's not real. Now you'd think, if you listen to it, this sounds pretty normal. There's probably just some random sounds thrown in the background. But let's listen a little closer. There is a railway crossing sound going off in the background. Additionally, we hear a train horn starting to go off in the background as well. I believe that this really is David Fincher saying, don't cross these tracks. Once you cross, you cannot go back. That's why the railway crossing sound is there. It lets us know we can imagine the bars going down, blocking the road, trying to stop you from getting in the way of the train that's about to smash straight through you. But in reality, the narrator still goes through with the punch and as soon as he does, we no longer hear the train horn or the railway crossing. It hit me in the ear! Well, Jesus, I'm sorry! Ow! Christ! Why the ear, man? Ah, I fucked it up. Kind of. Oh, that was perfect! Whoa! I love this moment. It is so subtle, but actually has so many layers to it, you really wouldn't expect it. What? You could deal with anything. This is actually a leading sound, what's known in editing as a J cut. And what this means is essentially a sound from the next scene bleeds in to the previous scene to lead us across to it, to basically make that transition into the next scene feel more seamless. But I think it's deeper than that because it actually, that water droplet sound was created by Tyler Durden himself. So is the next scene a complete figment of his imagination? Did he hear the water drop when he dropped those files? But it certainly points at a slightly strange, odd use of sound at that exact moment. And it works so perfectly that you barely notice it. Not the car you drive, not the contents of your wallet. Fucking khakis. This moment in the film is really quite interesting. It's one of only two major fourth wall breaks across the movie, which in itself is an unusual way to use fourth wall breaks. Unlike Deadpool or Fleabag, where fourth wall breaks are consistently used as a tool throughout the entire stories. You were the all singing, all dancing crap of the world. I believe this is David Fincher kind of saying, okay, this is a serious movie. 
but I'm reminding you that you're just watching a movie. It's nothing more, nothing less. And even the character's own ideology throughout the film is to let go of everything that controls us. So in a way, David Fincher uses a lot of the opportunities in this movie to break rules. I think what's really important to take away from all of these incredible sound design choices is that David Fincher always chose to use sounds that are synonymous to the space that we heard them within. He chose sounds that weren't so out of place that we thought that they were odd, but ultimately they were always slightly strange. They were always slightly off-putting or uncomfortable. And what it did is it actually enabled a sensation. It transferred a feeling to us as an audience to make us feel uneasy, to make us feel like something was wrong, but we couldn't quite put our finger on it because our brain could rationalize every sound but not how each sound was used.